It's an important thing to mention about sharecropping is it was not a racial system. It was for both white and black farmers. In fact, every census from 1880 to 1940 showed there were more white than black sharecroppers in the South. Now, the percentage among blacks was much higher than among whites, but there was still, this is a system which is spreading throughout the South, and one of the major changes in Southern life after the war is that whites start growing cotton. Because that's the only way they can get credit. Before the war, white people didn't grow cotton, except in a few upcountry parts of South Carolina. It was the plantations that grew cotton. White farmers grew food for themselves, raised hogs, that kind of thing. Now, the white farmer is trapped into this system just like, um, so, but they're coming from different directions. The blacks are moving up from slavery into sharecropping. More and more white farmers are falling down from owning their own land. When they're in debt, they lose their land. They fall into this position of tenant farmers beholden to merchants. Eventually, by the 1890s, as we will see in a week or so, you get this agricultural uprising in the South, the populist movement among small farmers who are desperate to change the credit system so that they can try to get back, um, back on their feet. And this system is also compounded by fraud, by cheating, by, increasing, by very high interest rates. Um, you see in the Janap book a little bit about, you know, at the end of the year when they settle up with the merchant or the planter, there's all these charges against the sharecropper. Some of them are legitimate, some of them aren't. That's another reason you better be literate, because they're going to present you with a list. Yeah, look here, in March you borrowed this much, and in May you borrowed this much, and here it all adds up. And by the way, you still owe me money. I'm taking your whole crop, it's worth this much, you're still in debt. So next year, you've got to keep the cycle of borrowing money to grow cotton. You'll never get out of debt. Sharecropping is not a ladder to um, prosperity or independence. It is a trap which people fall further and further into because of the way the credit system operates, the way the world market for cotton operates, uh, et cetera. And the sharecropping and crop lien system, as I say, lasts all the way to the 1930s when it is destroyed, basically, by the Great Depression, by the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which I just mentioned, by massive Af African American migration off the land, and eventually by the mechanization of cotton picking, which is something that comes quite late, and then they don't need so much labor. Is there anything Reconstruction governments could have done to alleviate this situation? Difficult to say. Um, short of massive land distribution, probably not. Just maybe short of setting up a state organized credit system where the government will, eventually that's what the populists say, the government should loan us money. Get out of this whole system of merchants. But that doesn't come, and it only comes long, well into the 20th century, by which time small farmers have been mostly wiped out anyway. But in other ways, they do try to at least alleviate some of the problems of these uh, small farmers, both white and black, um, one of the ways is, again, going back to this, the lean laws, lean laws. As I say, the planter, planter owes money to a lot of people. Who gets the first crack? Laws tell you who gets the first crack, the, who has the first lean, the second lean, the third lean. These governments pass laws, what they call laborer's lean. In other words, that the first person to get paid will be the worker, will be the sharecropper. The merchant has to wait. The banker, if there is one, has to wait. The first person who gets paid, the labor is lean, at least to try to protect the sharecropper from having everything lost at the end of the year. Again, when Reconstruction ends, those laws are changed. The merchant gets the first lien. The laborer is pushed way down the list and so often doesn't get anything. So in a sense, what's happening in Reconstruction, you know, one, um, one historian wrote that in Reconstruction, Republicans undertook to promote political equality in a society characterized by equality in nothing else, which is probably fair enough. Political equality, civil equality, but economically nothing remotely resembling equality. 
Reconstruction didn't fundamentally alter the balance of power on the land, but it did allow blacks to use political power to try to, in some ways, combat their economic weakness through these lean laws and laws about tenancy and everything. And a kind of, almost a kind of class stalemate develops in Reconstruction where the whites have the land, but the blacks have political power in a lot of areas and try to use that to balance off. The, the, the stalemate is broken by the end of Reconstruction, and after that, the whole power balance swings almost completely to the planter and merchant with the sharecropper just completely out in the cold. So certainly, the economic revolution does not go forward nearly as uh, as strongly as the political revolution of Reconstruction.